Okay, friends, I hope you are still with us after yesterday. Some of you are like, that's it. That's enough. I can't do that again. But it's going to be different today. So I hope yesterday was helpful. Um, for those of you that did not find it helpful, we are back in the scripture uh, today. And I hope the cultural context will open up a little bit more about what is happening here. So we're going to look at all of chapter 23. The main focus is on this one group of people, the Pharisees. And then we get to the end, Jesus speaking some words over Jerusalem, which represents um, uh, the Jews as a whole. Okay, so he gives these seven woes to the Pharisees. And with the context from yesterday, you can see, I mean, it's not that Jesus doesn't like these people. He's really sad for these folks that, that are so close, that get so much, but that, that, are, that are missing some things. A uh, couple little notes. You'll remember that Jesus' teaching begins with what? What's his first sermon? The great sermon? The Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount begins with what? The Beatitudes. So it's some words of blessing. Here near the end of his teaching, we have some words of woe. We can see that this is an echo of some places in the Old Testament where God gives blessings and woes or curses. Not curses as in, like, you did bad, so you're going to get bad. Not as in that, but as in, look, you just need to understand, like, you get off of like the path and things may not work out well for you. The same thing here. It's not that Jesus doesn't like the Pharisees. It's, hey, there are consequences to kind of the way that you're living out uh, your walk with God. And we need to uh, be clear about what those are. So um, remember, speaking to a group of people that he knows and that he loves, he gives these seven woes. We're not going to read the whole thing, but there's some things that I want to, uh, to highlight. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you. So look, they're in places of authority. You should listen to them, listen to their teachings, but not the works they do. What a condemnation that is. For they preach, but do not practice. This is the first of at least a couple of common phrases that we will hear today that you may not know come directly from Jesus, they don't practice what they preach. This is the first thing that he says about them. Look, you can trust what they say by and large. They're not actually living out what they say. They, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. Remember, Jesus said, my yoke, my teaching is easy. Look, look, Pharisees, you are weighing people down with all of these burdens. And in the way um, of God, the way that I am teaching should actually uh, free people up. Now look, 21st century American, to free people up doesn't mean to free people up to do whatever they want to. Because if we have learned anything about like our free society, it is that when we have no boundaries, no rules, no law in our lives, it actually ends up shackling us to ourselves and to bad habits and to bad decisions, okay? The fact that Jesus' yoke is light doesn't mean that there are no parameters on life. It means that the parameters on life that he gives us actually set us free. That's the great irony of all of like the liberty, like the self-liberty of the last decades is that it actually leaves many of us more enslaved. It is not that his yoke is easy because there are no expectations. There's no way of life. It isn't the expectation of the way of life. Free us, but the Pharisees, you're heaping on burdens that you're not keeping yourself. And they just weigh people down. And it's all about, verse 5, being seen by others. Skip on ahead to verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Or hypocrite is the word for actor. It means you're acting one way. You're not actually that way. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You think you're inviting people in, but actually you're keeping people out. Which not only would have been offensive to them, but any of them that thought maybe Jesus was on something, it would have been heartbreaking to them. It would be like saying to like you as a parent, like, I know that you want to bless your kids, but you're actually hurting your kids. You might be offended, but if you thought the person was on to something, it would actually be heartbreaking to you. The Pharisees who are beginning to believe that Jesus may be right, and there are some of them we know of Nicodemus, there are others also. Hey, this would have been heartbreaking to them. Woe to you blind guides. You know, we look to you. We, like broadly speaking as the Jewish people, we look to you Pharisees, teachers, as the ones to guide us, but you're blind. 
Here's the second phrase. The blind leading the blind. Right here. Right here from Jesus. And they would have been just heartbroken. Those of them that let this penetrate their hearts. I have so valued um, my position as a teacher, thinking that I was leading people, but, but maybe I'm blind myself. Some of them would just would have gotten mad. Some of those would just cut them right to the heart, right to the quick. And, and those that could see that Jesus knew what he was talking about, it would have been heartbreaking to them. Let's give it down, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. You like you give. You give your alms. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Those you ought to have done without neglecting the others. It's good that you, that you give. But you give of your resources. This would have been like giving money. You give of your resources. But you miss the compassion, the justice, the mercy, the faithfulness. You may begin to see a theme develop here. You blind guides, straining out the gnat and swallowing a camel. Straining out the gnat is like, um, it would have been a real thing. You know, a gnat gets in your wine, which then makes it unclean, so you can't drink it. So you, you get the gnat out of your wine, but yet this would have been a metaphor. You eat a camel. Like you, you, you pay attention to getting that gnat out, which is good. You should do that. But you miss, that they, 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 you're missing the bigger, the bigger things. Woe to you, 25 scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the plate, but the inside... You're full of greed and self-indulgence. This is where he, he see, he's making it clear and clear what the issue is. You clean the outside, but you don't worry about the inside. Think about cleaning the inside of a cup. If you clean the inside of a cup, odds are you're going to get the outside also, right? You like dip it in the bowl of water. Dip it in the soapy sink. And the outside will get clean too. You can clean the outside pretty easy without cleaning the inside. So you clean the inside, you're probably going to clean the outside also. Don't just worry about the outside, what people see. Let's talk about the inside, folks. It would have cut some of them right to the heart. Last little bit I'm going to read in this part. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. That's a powerful image when you get your head wrapped around what this means. Whitewashed tombs. Your tombs that, that, that look beautiful and clean on the outside. Outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of what? What's on the inside of a tomb? Dead people's bones. And all uncleanliness. We've talked about the um, Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. Between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount, on that um, western slope going up the Mount of Olives, there is today, and there was then, uh, tombs, graveyards. It's a picture of what it looks like today. Just, just hundreds, thousands of them. I don't know how many there were at the time. Somebody else could tell you. But if Jesus was teaching them in the region where we think that he was, he could have pointed at these tombs. If not, certainly they've seen them. He said, look at that. This is, what it, this is the way that you're practicing your religion. This is what this is like. You look great on the outside, but what is inside that tomb there? It looks so pretty on the outside. Just dead bones. Oh, man. Do you see what he is saying to, to, to his siblings, the people that he loved, the Pharisees? Do you see what he's saying to those who follow them, to those men and those women? He's saying, look, I believe that you mean well, but your obedience, it's just about what you do with your outward actions. You need not just for your outward actions to, to, to follow after the scripture and to be obedient, but what I long for you, Jesus is saying, is a renovation of your heart, a, a, a reworking of you inwardly. Or maybe you do, or maybe you don't look beautiful on the outside, but where you are alive on the inside. And if you are alive on the inside, you better believe that, 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 that your outward actions will change too. And it seems like he's pleading with people through language that can seem so harsh and is harsh. 
He is pleading with them. You got to work on this. It is not, don't picture, it is not as if it is um, uh, you like railing against someone that you don't like. It is you speaking to a dear friend about the ways in which you see their actions causing damage in their lives and other people's lives. So I'm sitting down almost as if it's like a family conversation. It's like an intervention. I love you. And I want to see you fully alive. And I want to see you blessing the people around you. But woe, woe to you. Because this thing about your life is killing you. And it's hurting the people around you. That's what this is. It's not like one last pot shot at them. It's one last like calling out to them. I want you to know what God wants to do in your life. And then he turns. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to him. How often have I gathered, how often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? He looks at Jerusalem. He says, oh, How deeply I long for you. And how I would have brought you under my wing the way that a hen protects her chicks. But you aren't willing. I, I, I want you to repent, to believe, to come and to follow me, but you're not willing. So your house is left desolate. He's looking out at the city that has hundreds of thousands of people in it. It's anything but desolate. But again, it's the outward appearance is great, but inwardly, we're sitting this rotting, is what he's saying. I tell you, you'll not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He knows that he's about to die. You won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which means you won't see him again until what? Until you come to believe who he is. It's not like he's out and you're not going to see me again because I'm going to be absentee. No. He's been teaching these people for three years whether they wanted to hear him or not. See that? Whether they wanted to hear him or not, he's been teaching them. And now he says, I'm going away, but I will still be available to you through the power of the Spirit. I will still be available to those of you who recognize who I am. And you seek to be like, or you seek me, I will still be available to you. And it's not in this account, it's in Luke. He actually weeps over the city. He's heartbreaking for it. Because he knows that, that not only is he going to die, but he also knows that the city is, is, is doomed for destruction. That, that it's inevitable. And, you know, less than 40 years later in 70 AD, Rome destroys the city. Destroys the temple. And, uh, all the stones are thrown down. We'll talk about that next week. And um, the city is, is, is left in, in ruins. And Jesus is saying, it did not have to come to this. It didn't have to come to this. Okay, I don't know how to put a bow on all of that. But I hope that what you are able to see is that this is Jesus reaching out to people with compassion. One more time. And again, it's the Pharisees that, that have... That, that have been frustrated with him, but that have continued to engage with him. It's the Sadducees, as we'll begin to see next week, who have no patience for him at all, and who actually are the ones that kill him. Okay, God bless you, friends. I hope your uh, reading continues to go well. And next week, we're going to talk about chapter 24, which is apocalyptic literature. We'll talk about what in the world that means on Monday. God bless you.